So, uh, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Chatter. Today, I have the pleasure of being joined once again by Gerd van den Bosch, uh, DVM, PhD, vaccinologist, author, innovator, entrepreneur, and author of the new book, The Inescapable Immune Escape Pandemic. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks, uh, Jos, for uh, having me on again. Yeah, no problem. It's, it's great to chat to you once again. Uh, the first one was so, so interesting and, and informative. Um, that when I saw you'd released the book, I was dying to once again get you back on. Um, so uh, your new book explores the impact of mass vaccination on indiv uh, individual and global health, explaining how powerful organizations, institutions and industries lacking an understanding of the complex environment have turned a natural viral pandemic into one of disastrous immune escape. For a good start for people... Um, perhaps would be the best thing to be to do would be have you explain what you mean by immune escape like w what does that term mean yeah well uh, of course immune escape is the is the key word uh, it's it's critical to understand this but basically in simple terms this means when you put the virus under pressure under in a hostile environment and so the hostile environment we are referring to within the context of mass vaccination is of course an immunological environment that is hostile to the to to the um, to the virus because uh, as a result of vaccination of mass vaccination whole populations are raising antibodies towards the virus, but we know that these antibodies cannot prevent the virus from replicating and therefore cannot prevent the virus from selecting certain variants that are able to overcome the kind of immune pressure that the whole population is exerting on the virus. And that leads to what we call, or what, what is called in evolutionary biology, natural immune selection, natural immune selection of variants that can still replicate under these conditions and can overcome basically the population level immune pressure that is exerted by the mass vaccinated population on the virus. And that is what drives more infectious variants to become dominant in the viral population. <clears throat> Over. So then, essentially, the the best the best place to start for this then for your book is why why has the vaccine pr like causing this immune escape rather than say natural immunity like what is what is the difference there that would would be that would you yeah. know cause us to not have this immune escape pandemic upon our doorstep yeah. Yeah, well, uh, that is that is inter uh, that is a very important question, and uh, you know, people should really do their best to understand basically why natural immunity is not driving immune escape, whereas mass vaccination does drive immune escape. Because you could be asking yourself the question: Well, wait a minute. During a natural pandemic, what we are seeing is, in fact, a mass immunization of the population, right? Because the virus is spreading, people will get exposed and will mount immunity. So there is a mass immunization effect. With mass vaccination, there is also a mass immunization effect. So why would mass vaccination drive viral immune escape, whereas natural immunity for example, you know, as mounted during a pandemic by the population, is not driving immune escape. So that is an important question for people, you know, to understand. And it is primarily due to the fact that there is one component <clears throat> that, you know, you need to enter into the equation and which has been completely ignored by, of course, the stakeholders of this campaign, by vaccinologists in general, which is innate immunity. So innate immunity is a very important component of natural immunity. I will give you an example that everybody can understand. When we were confronted with SARS-CoV-2, uh, the virus was completely new to the population. So uh, we call this the population was immunologically naive. 
Nobody had ever seen the virus. Nobody had antibodies. And guess what? I mean, 90% of the population, uh, you know, was more or less um, resistant to the virus. So people, some people did, of course, develop disease symptoms, mild symptoms, were in bed for a couple of days. You know, young people, children, very often didn't even develop symptoms, were asymptomatic. So how on earth is it possible that we get confronted with a foreign virus and that the majority of the population, basically all young and healthy people without underlying diseases, etc., were, you know, to a large extent protected against disease and certainly against severe disease and certainly against mortality. That is because of innate immunity. That is the immune, you know, the immune capacity that you have uh, as of birth, so to say, which is not very specific, which has um, a limited capacity. So that means that if this innate immunity is relatively weak, for example, in the elderly people, in people with underlying diseases, for example, then the virus can break through this innate immunity and then it will stimulate the adaptive immunity. That's where you will see that people will start to develop antibodies, high antibodies, etc. On the other hand, if you have a strong innate immunity, and that is, for example, the case with the unvaccinated people right now, because their innate immunity got very well stimulated and trained because of the repetitive exposure to the virus, then this innate immunity is so strong that it basically eliminates the, the bulk of the viral load. So that there is only like very few particles that still break through this innate immunity and that are going to solicit the adaptive immune system. So that is also the reason why people who have healthy people who have a well-trained innate immune system are going to develop only low titers of antibodies because the adaptive immunity is barely stimulated and those antibody titers will rapidly decline. So, of course, now, you know, the stakeholders of the mass vaccination campaigns, they say, oh, wait a minute, look at the antibodies of those who got naturally infected. The titers are low, miserable, lousy, they decline very rapidly, whereas with our vaccines, look at these very high titers. These idiots don't understand that this is due to the very strong and robust response of the innate immune system. So now to your point, what happens if you have this strong innate immune response? That means that by the time, by the time, so even if the, the adaptive immune system, let's say, is, is, is only weakly solicited, it will mount antibodies, but by the time these antibodies reach their optimal level, most of the viral load has already been cleared by the trained innate immune response. So that means that these antibodies can no longer put the virus under pressure, under antibody pressure, because the majority of the viral load has is already gone, has already been eliminated before these antibodies reach their optimal level. That is very, very uh, different in case of vaccination, because the vaccines are not these, remember, these are not live attenuated vaccines. So they don't stimulate the innate immune response at all. They only stimulate the antibody responses. And these antibodies take time to reach their optimal levels, their very high levels. That's why we need to boost people. Well, that's why, to some extent, they give them a third dose, etc. But during the time where these antibodies are, uh, in uh, are increasing, People are already, of course, because we are in a pandemic, exposed to the virus. So people are already exposed to the virus, for example, after the first dose or anyhow, at a point in time where these antibody levels are suboptimal. And that is what puts pressure on the virus without being able to eliminate the virus because the antibody titers are immature or, or the titers are too low. And that is what causing immune escape of the virus, a situation, as you pointed out with your question correctly, that is very different from the situation where we are dealing 
with natural immunity. Natural immunity is composed of two layers, a very important one, which is the innate immunity that when you train it, it can be so strong that you don't even need the second layer, which are which is the adaptive immunity and the antibodies. I don't know whether that makes it sufficiently clear why natural immunity is not going to drive immune escape, whereas mass vaccination during a pandemic, while people are exposed, will drive immune escape, viral immune escape. Okay, so just to make sure I've, got, I've understood this right, <clears throat> you're saying that the reason that the antibodies that are produced by the body as a result of natural infection do not drive um, the immune escape pressure because most of the virus has already been dealt with by the initial innate immune system that keeps things out. And therefore, Absolutely. the so yeah, so as, as the antibody response ramps up once you've become infected, by the time they're like being produced to deal with it and have started to like attack the, 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 the COVID-19 um, cells or virus or exactly whatever it is, but they they're only dealing with the tail end of things and they're just sort of like it's like they're the, the mop-up crew come to clean up the last few things yeah well and and what is interesting is that these antibodies may reach a relatively high titer not as high usually as with the vaccines and they will decline more rapidly but but when you get now reinfected during a natural pandemic these antibodies will be high enough to immediately neutralize the virus so there, there is not immune pressure either because these high titers are now capable of eliminating the virus. So that is why these vaccines and vaccines in general are only suitable in a kind of, you know, for prophylactic use. If you get vaccinated, for example, before you get exposed, then you have time to mount these high antibody levels that by the time you get exposed, they are high enough to deal with the virus in a way that the virus gets eliminated. And then, of course, there is no immune pressure either, right? So that is very important to understand because that is what happens during a natural pandemic in contrast to vaccination during a pandemic where we completely disturb this natural immune response, not only at an individual level, but also at the population level. Mm -hmm. Because it's when you do this at the population level that you exert this pressure on the virus which drives immune escape. It's not by just vaccinating part of the population like we do with influenza. Every year, you know, 1% maybe of the population, maybe even less. That is not going to cause enough immune pressure on the virus to be prone to this immune escape, or it could be, but at a very slow pace, right? If you do this massively and you vaccinate 60, 70% of the population, then that is really pushing the population to exert immune pressure on the virus so that it becomes more infectious because the virus escapes. And why does it become more infectious? Because the pressure you are exerting is pressure on the infectiousness. Why I'm saying this? Because the antibodies are directed against the spike protein and the spike protein is responsible for infectiousness. So the pressure exerted by the antibodies directed against spike, which is responsible for infectiousness, if they are not sufficiently functional, what you will see is that immune escape variants will prevail that are able to overcome this pressure on infectiousness, and therefore you naturally select variants that are more infectious. And that is what we have been seeing, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, uh, omicron. Mm -hmm. The common denominator was that they were more infectious right, than the precedent mm -hmm. once. So, yeah. So, so why is it that vaccinating people not eliminates, but maybe what, why, why is it in vaccinated people that they don't have the same innate immune response? Is it because the body's already primed to look for the spike protein and therefore there is no, no. innate immune response? So initially, so initially it's, it's very clear initially. Um, so when you vaccinate people with Life attenuated vaccines, uh, you may know that our childhood vaccines, measles, mumps, rubella, varicella, are life attenuated vaccines. Mm -hmm. So, you know, isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing that in 2023, 
we are still using, industry is still using this very old fashioned technology to manufacture live attenuated vaccines, which is very difficult and very tricky because if the virus gets too much attenuated, it will not work. If it's not sufficiently attenuated, you know, it could be dangerous. You also have this um, uh, safety uh, measures that you need to be taking, uh, you know, to contain the virus, etc. So it's, it's, this is complex, costs a lot of money, it's very elaborated. So why are they still doing this? Why do they not replace this by modern technologies? The reason is because these live attenuated vaccines, just like the live SARS-CoV-2, right, is stimulating the innate immune response. Only live vaccines can do this. Or I should say, uh, today in vaccinology, the only tool we have to stimulate innate immunity is by way of live attenuated vaccines, right? All the other vaccines that contain non-living uh, viruses or, or uh, like subunits and protein vaccines, um, they don't contain, of course, living viruses. They do not stimulate innate immunity. And therefore, so it's like they are not destroying the innate immune system. They're completely bypassing it. So somebody who gets vaccinated will not have the opportunity with these vaccines, with these vaccines, will not have the opportunity to train its innate uh, immune system. Whereas, of course, during a natural pandemic, at the beginning, of course, some people could get the disease because, you know, the virus, their innate immune system is not sufficiently trained. It's the first encounter with the virus. But as they recover from this, not only will they to some extent mount antibodies, but also their innate immune system got trained so that second time around, you know, your immune defense will be much better. That's how you also explain why today, for example, very, very few healthy, unvaccinated people still contract uh, COVID disease. Mm -hmm. Maybe very superficial symptoms, you know, but, you know, it's like one or two days, uh, they are not uh, uh, fit or they, 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 they don't feel very well, something like this, but it's not like, uh, you know, uh, being in bed and uh, uh, really suffering. So, and, and so that is thanks to the innate immune system, because we know that the virus uh, right now has become resistant to denutilizing antibodies. So, so it can only be the innate immune system and this innate immune system, that's a fantastic thing, is non-specific. So no matter how this virus continues to evolve in terms of, you know, all the different variations of the antigenic constellation, it doesn't matter because this innate immune system is non-specific. It has limited capacity. That's why it needs to be trained. If it's not trained, it's also relatively weak and it needs the support of the adaptive immune system. But if you train it, right, like we are doing, that's why I'm always saying the people who are best protected against SARS-CoV-2 today are the unvaccinated people in a highly vaccinated countries because the virus is still circulating a lot in highly vaccinated countries, many variants changing all the time, and the unvaccinated get exposure after exposure. But after a while, their innate immune system gets so well trained that within 24 hours, you know, they simply eliminate the virus mm -hmm. before even the virus had a chance to um, to cause any kind of uh, symptomatology. Yeah. So does does this in innate immune system say like across a population scale? Does this have an influence upon the R number of the disease itself? Yeah, of course. But you know, these R numbers that that is that's why I'm laughing about is because <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Uh, People, and that is why all the modeling eh, based on this R number, etc., none of this modeling applied. You know, all these very intelligent mathematicians, etc., and epidemiologists, they miserably failed with their modeling because, because these things are not constant, right? So what I'm saying here is not only the, is the virus evolving, but as the virus evolves, the immune system will also adapt. So there is a tremendous dynamic of the interaction between the virus changes, the immune system will change as well, the, the response, the immune response will change as well. As a consequence of a changing immune response, you will again 
cause changes in the virus, right? Well, mm -hmm. not you will not cause mutations, but you will have an influence on natural selection. Yeah. So that nothing is constant, but very clearly, to your point, innate immunity induces or has sterilizing capacity. That is also the reason why during a natural pandemic, you will see that ultimately the viral transmission rate and the R, so to say, dramatically declines till it reaches, uh, it reaches a level that is so low that even unimmunized people do no longer contract the kind of disease. Mm -hmm. That is what we call herd immunity. So the herd immunity during a natural pandemic is largely due to innate immunity. Yeah. Of course, it can be supplemented or, or it can be, yes, supplemented by, not uh, supplemented, but completed, I should say, by adaptive immunity, by antibodies, right? But it, it, natural immunity is much richer. That is what I wanted to say. It's composed of innate immunity and adaptive humoral immunity in terms of SARS-CoV-2, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, whereas the vaccine-induced immunity is only based on the antibodies. And we know that the virus has been changing as a result of immune escape, so the antibodies were no longer efficacious. And right now, the uh, vaccine-induced antibodies have a strongly diminished utilizing capacity towards the Omicron descendants. We know this. This is nothing new, right? Yeah. yeah. So why... Because this is not, this is like, I've obviously I've spoken to yourself before. I've spoken to a lot of different people on this topic um, from like immunologists to virologists to vaccinologists to um, like policymakers, uh, people who like to talk to like behavioral psychologists. And I'm fairly certain that no one aside from you has mentioned this two-tier immune system or the phrase innate immunity. I I, mm. I heard that nowhere. Yeah. Right? And it seems well, like it's a big deal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course. And it's not surprising. It's not surprising. So, I mean, if you read through my book, you don't need to read it in detail, but you will see that the major focus is basically on immunology. It comes back all over again that all these virologists and even immunologists who are focused on the classical Im uh, immunology and on the classic uh, vaccinology, where innate immunity is not considered really a very efficacious compartment of the immune system, I don't understand this because in every textbook, Charles, in every textbook, you will read, this is our first line of immune defense. The innate immunity. You can open a textbook in a first line of immune defense, and hence it gets completely ignored. And to your point, I'm saying that one of the biggest gaps in the current interpretation of the dynamics of the pandemic is the lack of insight and understanding of how, not how the immune system works, but how it deals with a virus that is continuously evolving, right? Because, for example, trained innate immunity is something that has been documented 20 years ago. But it has never, never found, let's say, it has never been introduced in the field of vaccinology, for example. Because our vaccines are primarily, and certainly the COVID-19 vaccines, stimulating the adaptive immunity. But on the other hand, nobody's telling you, why, for God's sake, are we still using this old-fashioned live attenuated vaccine technology to immunize our children. They are so efficacious because of strong stimulation of the innate immune response. And that's the bit, that's the bit, that, to my understanding, is the the most effective like technology that we've come up with in this field. Like the Well, well, I should say, I should say that um, before the COVID crisis, my endeavors, my scientific endeavors were very much concentrated on this very topic in a sense that we all know, and I'm a vaccinologist and I'm certainly anything but an anti-vaxxer, but we all know that vaccinating children with live attenuated vaccines is not ideal because in some cases, you know, we can cause disease. 
or we can cause autoimmune disease, you know, through certain derailments. We are still dealing with a live virus. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, some children with maybe underlying disease or genetic deficiencies, you know, the outcome could not be the most desirable outcome. Of, of course, these are exceptions, but it does occur. So what I've been concentrating on, and it's not to focus on myself and on my technology, but I think it makes a lot of sense, is the question, how can we stimulate innate immunity without using live attenuated viruses, right? And that is where it comes in, uh, you know, the natural killer cell technology, etc. I'm not going to elaborate on this, but uh, yes, it's for the time being the best we have. Mm. But it's still not ideal. And I've been continuously, you know, in the past 10 years advocating for making, you know, a better approach where we can get rid of safety issues that are sometimes associated with the administration of live attenuated vaccines in children. Mm. Well, I mean, I guess that's what they were hoping the mRNA technology would be, but it, it hasn't really quite played out like that thus far. Um, so, so to go back to this innate immunity, why why do you think this was just not mentioned in in the discussion, in the coverage, in debate? Like, because it's not like as much as like YouTube and Twitter have attempted to try and like censor or tamp down on some of the the debates and discussions that have gone on around this since since March 2020 mm. there like they, the debates have still gone on right whether it's on rumble or odyssey or um you know i've managed to sneak under the radar somehow with a lot of conversations i've had but like no one has talked about this like where was the where were the people discussing this like given that it's such an important part of the immune system yeah, well well, just the, 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 the answer is very easy. Eh? It's commercially, commercially speaking, it's completely, you know, of it's of no interest. If I'm telling you, uh, Jules, if you're dealing with this kind of, of disease, not with any kind of disease, I'm, I'm saying there are some cases where you need a different approach. But in this case with SARS-CoV-2, if I'm telling you, wait a minute, uh, make sure, take good care of your health. Make sure you have no overweight, you, you do exercise, etc. Don't be afraid of getting ill. What's wrong about getting ill, getting severely ill, you know, being hospitalized, dying? That is a serious problem. But getting ill, that's how you strengthen also your immunity. So make sure you're in good health. Don't care if you're two days in bed or three days in bed, you know, if yeah, and, and some people will even, you know, uh, I know people have gone through this whole COVID crisis, not being vaccinated, have not been ill at all, for mm. example, right? And make sure that, for example, in winter, you take your vitamin D and, and all this type of thing. Basically, a lot of common sense, take good care of your body, take care of your health and your natural immune defense that has been proven, that has been shown in so many studies, will be very strong, right? And that is also the reason why we have seen that only vulnerable people and elderly people, and even elderly people who did not have overweight, who were still in pretty good shape, etc., did not really suffer. Maybe they became ill just like younger people, a few days in bed, and, and that's it. Of course, the likelihood that you start to struggle with underlying diseases uh, uh, becomes higher uh, the older you get, of course. That, that is very clear. But all these recommendations that I'm giving here, you cannot you you cannot ask any money for this, right? It's <laughs> it's all for free. You cannot commercialize this. No, but you are laughing. But that's the thing. And a lot yeah. of this we are seeing a lot of this with not just with vaccines, also with drugs. Mm -hmm. You know, they, these pharmaceutical companies make people believe that our life is only possible if we continuously. You know, use these medications and 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 again, I'm not against vaccines. But if you ask me, if you're vaccinating way too much, if you're vaccinating in cases where you know it's even contraindicated, etc., I'm definitely saying yes. People are telling me, you know, let's get rid of all the vaccines. We do no longer vaccinate children, even in developing countries. We do no longer. Then I'm saying no, because we are starting to see gaps in the herd immunity, mm -hmm. and that's where epidemics start, for example. Right. So it's very, very balanced. And if people don't understand how these things work, 
They will, of course, never understand, but industry is not interested in innate immunity because all the elements that stimulate your innate immunity, that are good for your innate immunity, none of them can really be commercialized or they are commercialized in terms of food supplements. Mm. But that is not that is not uh, the privilege of uh, the, the pharmaceutical industry only, of course. Yeah. Others can can commercialize those supplements as well. Right. Yes. So that's the reason. It's It's very easy. Oh, I mean, it is the most, it's uh, the most obvious answer to the question, but also one of the most depressing. I'd almost, I'd almost prefer if they were idiots. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Well, commercially speaking, they're certainly not, uh, not, uh, not idiots, right? No. But, uh, but, but yeah, in terms of um, uh, getting uh, completely disconnected from nature, and thinking that uh, technologies are much stronger than our own biology and nature, that is that is a very weird idea. And, and therefore, I'm often referring to them as idiots because they are completely dissociated from, from nature, yeah. from, yeah. you know, uh, simply common sense, because common sense is often so cheap you know, and so, you know, straightforward that you cannot commercialize it, right? Yeah. So the the question that, that then sort of springs to mind for me is like you've you've been in these circles and you've you've you know spoken to quite a lot of these these people and you spent a lot a long career. You um as far as I remember you worked for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation at one point. Um what is it that gives them that idea that that we can be more powerful or effective than nature in many cases. Like we can just come up with some pill and the 10 years of research that goes into that is better than the 10 million years of evolution that, that we've gone through. Like yeah. What what drives that attitude in your opinion? Well, what drives that attitude, uh, according in my humble opinion and according to my uh, experience, is unfortunately, unfortunately, the strong belief that with new technologies, we can easily overcome these things, right? So think about this. How on earth would somebody, would somebody understand, comprehend that on one hand side, we can send satellites to, to Mars and all kinds of planets. Extremely, can you imagine mathematically how complex this is? We, we can barely understand this. This is, this is just amazing mm -hmm. you know, what technology can do, right? Yeah. And compared to that, we wouldn't even be able to control a small you know, organism like a virus that is causing a pandemic, whereas we have all these novel technologies, uh, mRNA, DNA, vectorized. Uh, uh, it's simply unbelievable. And the real technocrats, right? Unfortunately, none of them have taken a deep dive in biology, evolutionary biology. They don't seem to realize that this balance, this ecosystem, between the virus and the immune system has been shaped over millions of years. Every single time based on a competitive advantage of the strongest of the fittest, right? It's, it's very well shaped. It's an ideal system, in fact, that, uh, that allows the virus or the pathogen to persist and it doesn't damage the population too much, right? So, and it in fact eliminates the weaker elements of the population. I mean, this seems very, very strange, but you know, my background is veterinary, uh, veterinary science, veterinary medicine. So we look at at, at animals in population level for economical reasons. You don't look at uh, you don't look at the cow separately, but you know, at the whole herd of cows, eh, cattle. You look at poultry as a population. The same for pigs, etc. And there, of course, the weaker elements will get uh, uh, eliminated, which keeps your population, so to say, in sound. So I'm not advocating for this type of forces, you know, to come into effect all the time, because we have treatments where we can treat sick people, for example. But what I'm saying is that it seems to be so difficult for technocrats who have a lot of influence, a lot of money, 
how on earth can you imagine that you make, you know, all these programs that you make, <laughs> like Microsoft, for example, you know, what what a fantastic, uh, what a fantastic invention, what a fantastic tool, what a revolutionary technology. Mm -hmm. And then you wouldn't even be able to control a, a virus, one of the smallest microorganisms ever, despite the fact that we have all these modern technologies. Mm -hmm. So there, there is a, a lot of, I think, you know, um, a derailment and disconnection from from nature and very often you will see that you know that's my experience that people who don't have any of this scientific background like like me and many others very simple you know people you know but they have still this natural instinct that something is wrong here and they they think well i'm in good health I feel perfectly well. I'm doing a lot of exercise. I'm I'm doing my best to eat healthy food, etc. Why should I have all these injections? These people can do the reasoning that I'm now sharing, yeah? but still they are still so connected to nature that you know. Luckily enough, they they still feel like this is not the right thing to do. Mm. So um, it's yeah. It's um, it's unfortunate, and it's always at the top that these things happen. And then there is, of course, the brainwashing. And you know, uh, so we cannot say that these are all bad people. I'm always saying, you know, ninety percent of these people working in these organizations, working in industry, etc., are people like you and me, mm -hmm. very integral people, nice people, you know, etc. But it's always at the top, at the top, that things go wrong, and that there is, you know, own agendas, and uh, that there is push for 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 technologies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then, of course, the whole organization follows the top, of course. You have no choice, right? So it's complex, Charles. But um, on the other hand, it's, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's not more complicated than, than what I'm saying. So, uh, um, yeah, please, over to you. <laughs> That's all right. Um, so the, one of the things that you say in the book is that um, – there was a lot of experts thinking that Omicron was going to be the end of the pandemic, that that we'd sort of eventually arrived at this thing that was so, not harmless, but so much weaker than the original variant that eventually it would just sort of die out and no one would be infected. And it was, they expected it to be the end and that would have been it, right? But that yeah. has not been the case. Um, and you also make the, the case in the book that you think that the, the most highly vaccinated um communities or societies or countries are going to be the ones that are hit hardest by the fact that this hasn't yet died out. Could you explain why you think that is? Well, uh, first of all, with Omicron, um, this is relatively easy to explain. Uh, to your point, indeed, people, you know, at the beginning, on all sides, I mean, not just people who were against the mass vaccination, but also, of course, uh, the, 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 uh people who were promoting mass vaccination campaigns they uh were kind of like uh, very enthusiastic uh when omicron all, all of a sudden started to circulate because they were saying well wait a minute sir uh omicron is re really a blessing this is just going to boost vaccine induced immunity and uh, we see that the virus is more infectious, so that is going to promote, in fact, herd immunity because more people will get infected and it's mild. So that's an ideal situation. And that is where I'm saying if you don't have a deep understanding of immunology or of these interactions, you can so easily make a case for the mainstream narrative, right? It's only when, you know, the devil is always into the detail. If you start scrutinizing these things, you say, okay, wait a minute. Yeah, Omicron, but wait a minute. Omicron causes vaccine breakthrough infections. So remember was a, what I was saying with natural immunity, natural pandemic, you get exposed. And as a result of this exposure, you develop immunity, natural immunity composed of innate and adaptive, uh, like I, I explained that will ultimately protect you in a way that it will even sterilize and use sterilizing immunity and dramatically diminish the transmission of the virus. Have we seen this with Omicron? No, on the contrary. The immunity that wasn't used by Omicron, right? The Omicron descendants were resistant to this immunity. So you had Omicron, people got infected, they got vaccine breakthrough infections. They were not protected. 
And guess what? The next variants of Omicron were resistant against the antibodies that were induced by the very early Omicron strains or lineages. Mm. So this is anything but herd immunity, of course. So what I'm explaining in my book, which is a, a complex phenomenon that is, in fact, and I will explain it in as simple words as possible, is that this weak immunity that resulted from the vaccine breakthrough infections, that this immunity ultimately, because it was weak, eh, because it was also limited in time, etc., it in fact contributed to immune escape. Remember, if you have a suboptimal immune response and you have that massively across the population, and remember, the vaccine breakthrough infections massively occurred in the population, in highly vaccinated populations. So you had, again, a massive induction of weak immune responses that initially were kind of like fantastic because remember, people who had vaccine breakthrough infections were protected for some time, just a few weeks, maybe a month or, or so, and then they became reinfected again. So the immunity was in fact too weak to control the virus and to prevent its replication, etc. cetera. And, and guess what? What it did was that it expedited and it accelerated even the immune escape. So as a consequence of Omicron, or Omicron has in fact led to what I'm calling a self-fueling chain of immune escape. It's self-catalyzed, it's self-catalyzed, in fact, its transition into more infectious descendants. The newer Omicron descendants are more infectious, right? So that got catalyzed by the initial Omicron infections because they cause vaccine breakthrough infections, weak immunity, that weak immunity directed against the infectiousness of the virus led to more infectious Omicron descendants, right? like the uh, XBB15, uh, the 116 that we are seeing right now, and the BAs, uh, 4, 5, etc. right? So basically, this was not at all uh, a positive event because it just made things worse. It made immune escape worse. And that is the reason why I've been saying the, the advent of Omicron uh, represents, in fact, a point of no return, in a sense that even if at that point we would have stopped completely, completely the mass vaccination, we would not have stopped the, you know, the continued evolution of immune escape variants. We would have slowed it down, but not stopped it. And that is what we're seeing right now, because you see in some countries, uh, you know, vaccine coverage is dramatically diminishing and, and people, you know, uh, are no longer interested in getting a fourth or a, five, a fifth shot, et, et cetera. Yeah. Nevertheless, the infections are continuing. The evolution of the virus is continuing. Right. So it, this is this is something we cannot not, uh, not stop any longer. And therefore, I'm saying no, Omicron was a scourge. It was not a blessing. And basically it will go into, you know, uh, will be marked in history as a point of no return. That is what I'm very, very certain. Of. And that is, of course, very sad as well, because that means that, um, you know, even globally stopping the mass vaccination, is not no longer going to solve that problem. It would have solved the problem before the advent of Omicron, but Omicron caused vaccine breakthrough infections led to this phenomenon of immune refocusing. People can read this in the book, but it basically means that it induced weaker immune responses that unfortunately made the situation even worse after, after there was a short break where these antibodies work to some extent. That's also the reason why my predictions, I predicted this unfortunate event of immune escape to more virulence to occur much earlier. But there was a catch up by the immune system after the vaccine breakthrough infections. But unfortunately, it has simply led to an expedition of, uh, of, of immune escape. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry you... for being so long and, uh, you know, but it is complex. It's complex. And, you know, that is if, if people simply understand by by just glancing at my book or, or reading a few pages, if they simply understand that the, this whole thing is way more complex than experts and health authorities try to make us believe, 
because for them it's very simple. You get yourself vaccinated, you get your children vaccinated, you're done, you'll be fine, etc. If that is the only thing that I achieve, you know, with many people that they say, oh, look what Van Bosch is writing, it seems to be a way more complex, these interactions between the virus, the immune system, at the population level, heavily influenced by mass vaccination, then I'm, I'm very satisfied. Then my goal, uh, as far as sharing this information with laymen, uh, has been achieved, I would say. So your goal is to, to essentially express the, the complexity that, 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 that is well, involved here. Just, I want this to be documented. In fact, in fact, the big conclusion of my book is very easy, is that nothing, nothing was so predictable than that mass vaccination would have detrimental consequences on both individual and global health. And I'm bringing the scientific arguments together. Yeah, a lot of immunology, of course, that uh, support this and that show uh, the logic of this so that nobody could ever say, oh, wait a minute, we, we, yeah, we could have known this. Uh, this was completely unprecedented. Uh, you know, we had so many scientists looking into this. Uh, we had so many models, mathematical models, epidemiological models. Uh, nobody was able to predict this. So uh, we have done the best we could. No, there are very clear and compelling scientific arguments that make us able to predict that this is not going into the right direction. And at least in all modesty, my book and my arguments are compelling enough to take this case very, very seriously. Right. That's the least I would say. Mm. So essentially, you you want to make it clear that this was not a, oh, my goodness, we had no idea what was yeah. going to happen situation. Like that the, the, the evidence was there that, that, that this was... Of was course, it, you, you need to likely. dig into this. You need to delve deep. You need to dig into this. If if you understand only virology, you can never, ever come to this conclusion. If you un only understand immunology, you cannot. You, you need to, to be able to draw from all these different fields because it's a complex puzzle. And that's the front page of my, of my book, The Cover. It's mm -hmm. the puzzle, putting the pieces of the puzzle together. When you do this, it starts making a lot of sense. A lot of, and I'm just waiting till this book gets fact-checked, right? Because, no, I mean, it's not just like one argument, right? I'm drawing from these different fields, putting these pieces of the puzzle together. Then you, you, you find a picture that is so compelling that although I hate to say this, that I'm not positive with regard to the final outcome, I'm not a, a gloom and do preacher. I hate to be that, you know, but it's so compelling that at least I I felt obliged, uh, you know, to share that message that, uh, you know, it's it's not over. And and what health authorities try to make us believe that just based on the diminished incidence of severe disease and hospitalization, that we are now entering this phase of endemicity and that the pandemic is more or less over. Unfortunately, it's not true. And that is why the subtitle of my book, right, is Society in Highly uh, Vaccinated Countries will be taken by surprise, right? Because, of course, the narrative says, you know, what are you worried about? Look, hospitalizations are under control, mortality rates are even less in many countries than at the beginning of the pandemic, at, at least as far as... Um, mortality cases due to COVID are concerned. And then you're saying, you know, you're protected against severe disease. People are full of antibodies. Uh, we are having herd immunity, et cetera. And none of this applies. People are full of antibodies, but these antibodies do not neutralize. So I don't care about antibodies that, that, that are not functional. And, you know, the herd immunity has nothing to do with the title of the antibodies. It has to do with the capacity of the population to diminish viral transmission to a level that is so low that even people who have not been exposed will be protected against disease. That is the real definition of herd immunity, right? Mm -hmm. So, and also the severe disease. I mean, just if you have the chance to ask any scientist the following question, how can you explain that despite the fact that the vaccine induced antibodies have almost completely lost their neutralizing capacity, how can you then still explain 
that many vaccinated people up till now are still protected against severe disease and even disease. We know that neutralizing antibodies against this type of viruses, this type of in infections, are completely protective. But we don't have these neutralizing antibodies anymore. The, the capacity has dramatically diminished. So there must be something else. In the vaccines, it's clearly not innate immunity. That's what I just explained. So what is it? That's what I have been studying. I have an explanation for this. None of these experts care about this, right? They don't know what's going on. They don't understand where this is going. Nevertheless, they continue to recommend vaccination, mm. even in children, eh, boosters, et cetera, et cetera. It's simply insane. Yeah. I mean, I think we are seeing some of the tide turn in. Um, like even even yesterday, this, I was searching for this this clip to show people um, and pull it up. It was uh, Justin Trudeau claiming that he'd never he never forced anyone to get vaccinated and said yeah, there yeah. are potential side effects. Um, mm, just so, of so I, I think I think what we're seeing is is people realize that that maybe not to the level that you would hope. Um, or to the the level of understanding that that we would we would endeavor people to have yeah. of, of mistakes they had made, but at least there seems to yeah. be there's there's a change in 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 the wind. I think is the best way to put it. Like there's a lot mm. of people who either were very very vocally in support of this plan who have now either stopped talking about it altogether yes. or um, are sort of being forced to quietly be like, yeah, you know, maybe I was wrong. Mm. Um, so, so that gives me at least some hope that that perhaps people might um, wake up to the reality that you're you're explaining here. Mm. Um, but I won't hold my breath. <laughs> um, yeah. So, sure. like, have you had a lot of opposition, or or have you had people um, coming out and and trying to challenge things that you've said here? Like, have you had? I, I don't know who would come to you, like people at the CDC or media personalities or like f other scientists challenge you on Twitter, maybe, or something like, have you had anyone come out to you and go, you're wrong, this well, is most why? Of the, most of the attacks have been, uh, you know, uh, my person, uh, that I'm not sufficiently qualified, I'm not holding high positions in <laughs> academia, I'm not having sufficient publications, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. But in terms of scientific discussion, yeah, Jossi, we, you know, we have been reaching out several times to scientists, to academia, say, come on, let us have a discussion, right? The only exchanges that, and there are very, very few, have been in writing, where some people, you know, uh, recently this was an association of Canadian immunologists were, so to say, criticizing some of my statements. And, uh, you know, they put this in writing. I responded to every single of their comments, I think, in a very convincing way. I've not heard back from them, but I must say I was really surprised because these are immunologists about the lack of the lack of insight that these people are having in, in the current you know, dynamics of this pandemic. And, and of course, you know, these uh, people from academia in their ivory towers you know, most of them have never put their hands really on a vaccine. These guys are not interested in solving problems, in solving health problems. They're just interested in publishing, in making publications. Mm. That is very, very different, right? And um, so I, I think we need to be very, very careful also with the conspiracy theories, etc. Because what I'm finding out is that this departed really from ignorance, from lack of knowledge, from complete, complete underestimation of, uh, you know, the kind of interactions and the complexity, etc. And then they take a position and then they open the door to industry. Of course, industry jumps on this, not asking too many questions, certainly not about your health. It's about enriching the shareholders. And then all of a sudden you get this momentum where you have a train that is going down the track and that you can no longer stop, right? So, of course, people who hear all this confusion and definitions that change and, and experts who change their opinions and uh, lack of transparency and lack of information and, you know, and now also to some extent lies, etc. I can fully understand that people say, oh, wow, this is all pre-programmed and, and conspiracy, etc. I cannot emphasize enough 
the lack of knowledge and insight into the science that has uh, caused, uh, you know, um, a lot, a lot of this uh, completely, completely wrong decisions that have been taken. And if you are at a very high position, of course, then you have the obligation, more or less, to defend your position. And that is why you see some people start now to be hiding, become silent, or they are trying to change a little bit the wording of what they said in the past, but they have become very cautious. And uh, and I can tell you that, you know, even experts and health experts and scientists are very worried about the way the virus is currently evolving. Mm-hmm. That I can tell you. I can see this from publications, etc. Of course, of course, yes. nobody will make the link with mass vaccination because then, you, you know, it's finished. Your grants, your financial support, your career in academia is finished, right? So they are describing all this, but not making the link, of course, with uh, the uh, mass vaccination. But isn't it surprising, by the way, that we don't see any of these issues in Africa, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think... Honestly, I think if if um, some people were forced to 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 confront like why Africa just didn't die, like why they aren't all dead, um, it would uh, it would rock a lot of people's uh, yeah. understanding or worldview maybe um, to the foundations. But I, I just want to 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 point out to point out something you said there about about not wanting to to like jump deep into conspiracies but uh, conspiracy theories and i think you're 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 dead right um things can be labeled as conspiracy theories but the 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 key is to not jump down wild speculation that based on things that you don't understand is to try and get the best possible information and present that and if that is then labeled as a conspiracy theory you can tell people to uh well go away in uh, maybe yeah. more explicit terms. Yeah, but, but of course, <laughs> you have to always check on to what extent uh, do people have a conflict of interest. This has been a huge, a huge problem. I mean, all these consultancies, they're all consulting for this public health organization, having, of course, uh, actions and stakes in these big pharma companies. That it's very, you know, very few people are really independent, right? And, and that is a huge... A huge problem. So I'm always telling people, look, uh, if people talk to you, first verify, do they have a conflict of interest? Secondarily, uh, verify whether they are purely focused on the virology. You know, they can have multiple degrees in virology, but not understanding really the immunology or vaccinology, etc. Can they draw from several different fields? And are they willing to, to accept an open debate? If the answer to all this is no or negative, you know, I mean, people need to start asking themselves questions with regard to the credibility of these people. That is what I think. Right. Yeah. yeah right. I mean, I think probably down down the road, we'll see a, a reckoning for, for a lot of these figures. Um, mm. Or maybe not possibly, even. Yeah. Possibly they'll just sort of quietly fade out and, and yeah. try to, yeah, slip into mm. the, the background as if they were never here. I assume that's what Anthony Fauci is going to do. Mm. <laughs> and there's, there's yeah, well, plenty I'm, of I'm not speculating either I, no. what I strongly believe is that we will still see uh, a strong response from nature mm-hmm. uh, you know to restore this balance to restore this balance it's basically a balance that has been profoundly disturbed and uh, nature will re-establish that balance it will come at a price we don't know exactly how high this price will be but um, you know uh, for me for me uh, uh, it's the virus that has the pandemic under control. You know, parties are trying to control one another, you know, and they are fighting like two dogs over a bone while the third dog is running away with the bone. You know this saying or this story. And that is that is nature, right? And we, we rarely had these kind of confrontations in, in history, even with wars and all kinds of, you know, revolutions. Mm-hmm. It was one part of mankind against the others, right? Here, there is a third party that has a tremendous impact, which is nature, which is the virus. You know, this is the element that is not under control at all, not by any of these parties, right? It's very worrisome. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, probably the the best comparison you could make in in history 
would be the way that humans introduced invasive species into different parts of the world um, to yeah. deal with a problem only to have that species take over. Um, yeah. It was rarely successful. Yeah, very rarely. <laughs> uh, so there's there's a place, there's a place, I cannot remember where it is in America, where they they introduced carp and it took over yeah, yeah, yeah. the whole way yeah. up to the Great Lakes and there's like one river where if it gets into there, it will. It gets through that river. It will destroy like yeah. most of the fishing industry of one part of North America, and they have a an electrified part of the river. Like there's a voltage like that goes across like an electric net to stop any fish going past this part of the river. Like they've and it's it's got like three fail safes and it's behind like massive, massive vaulted doors that would belong in a nuclear silo because that's how <laughs> hilariously yeah. important it is that they don't let the fish go further than that. Um yeah. anyway. Yeah. Um all these type of things. Yeah. Again, technology is trying, you know, to conquer biology. It's mm. not possible, right? Yeah. yeah. Biology always has the last word. There is no doubt about this. Mm. Yeah, well, the universe hits back hard. Um, <laughs> life's a bitch, mm. I think, is the the, mm. the the best way to put it. Mm. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, Dr. Van den Bosch, it has been uh, an absolute pleasure, like super educational and interesting uh, as, as ever. Um, so is there anything you want to plug specifically before we finish up here, aside from the book, or you can mention well, the book? Yeah, no, yeah, people, of course, uh, you know, they will find uh, all the information to uh, my book under uh, drgeert.com. But uh, as I always say, my intention is not, you know, uh, to make uh, profits and commercialize, but my intention is really to get the message uh, spread. And, and because I think it's important that people realize that behind all this naive talk that we are hearing, uh, you know, not just myself, but other people are doing very difficult and hard homework and, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to clarify a number of things that are simply completely misunderstood and that lead uh, to this er erroneous, um, erroneous uh, narrative, basically. And, um, yeah, besides, uh, <clears throat> besides uh, that, I um, intend to... And I have already made a number of slides where I'm summarizing. I think I send them to you, the key messages in my book. And we will probably do, you know, some some kind of, uh, well, no, it's not a really promotional campaign, but spread this in a way that it is more understandable for people, like, uh, you know, a series of 10 videos with each time a key question uh, uh, where I summarize in just one or two minutes the key idea behind this to make it more understandable. Because of course, I do realize that my book is, uh, you know, some of the chapters are uh, really uh, rather targeting uh, my peers uh, in industry or health experts, etc., cetera. Uh, and that it's not all readily accessible to, uh, to lay, uh, lay people. But I think with these messages, we can at least simplify a little bit and make people understand the key uh, messages. That's what we are, uh, are uh, going to do. And uh, besides that, I thank people like you and many others who are uh, giving us a voice and uh, who are enabling us to share uh, this important information, I think, um, with uh, all those who are interested in, in hearing this and have a critical view and an open mind. Thanks a lot. Just. No problem. That's a lovely place to leave it. So I will put uh, links for everything you mentioned and we talked about it in the description below for people to find your book, your website, all of that stuff. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Just. Hey, everyone. Thanks for making it right the way to the end of the podcast. I love that you tuned in this long. Do me a favor, hit subscribe because 80% of you bastards are not subscribing, but you're watching my videos. See you next time.